So one of the things I teach when I teach uh, about how to accept life as it is, I teach two strategies. Number one is the five minute rule. And number two is what I call the can't change it mantra. So the five minute rule I learned before the accident, because that's what I used uh, when I woke up from the coma. And the five minute rule, I learned it in my sales training. And it was simply that uh, when something goes wrong, you know, you get bad news, you, you, you fail to reach a goal, you know, you go bankrupt, you know, someone dies. I mean, literally, whatever it is. Um, we were taught to set our now, now to be fair, it was the context was sales. So it was like customer cancels an order, you don't reach your goal for the week, right. you drive out to an appointment and no, somebody no shows you. And rather than let it ruin your day or your week, <laughs> yeah. you set the timer on your phone for five minutes and you give yourself yeah. five minutes to bitch, moan, complain, cry, vent, punch a wall. Great and practice. then you say, and then I move on to this three word mantra, which is the timer goes off, take a deep breath. And I say three words, can't change it. It's a simple acknowledgement. I can't change what happened five minutes ago. So right now I have a choice. I can either be miserable and blame it on what happened five minutes ago, or I can accept what happened five minutes ago because I can't change it. And the only logical choice I really have is to accept it and be at peace with it. And then focus 100% of my energy on what I can change. Mr. Hal Elrod, welcome to we Men This Way. We just jumped off a cliff, Brian. We're hang gliding. Let's do That's it. That's, uh, I, I love flying. It's a little nervous <laughs> that that run off the cliff always gets me in tatters, man. I feel in tatters, but I think we're good. We're, we're I don't know. Are we good? How are we doing now? How are we're you doing? We're doing great, man. Have you, have you actually <laughs> hang glided before? I have skydived. Okay. I've done skydiving as well. Yeah. Never hang glided, never base jumped. That's another one I would really love to do. Like the, the, the idea of mm. like, you know, running off of, a cliff, running off a cliff, yeah. man. Like that's yeah. some superhero shit right there. Anyone could just yeah. fall out of a plane. I don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like that's just, but just jumping off a cliff. Holy moly. I yeah. like, well, dude, I, 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 the wingsuit, the squirrel suit or wingsuit, uh. like the, that, that's always been really intriguing to me. I, I don't, I haven't looked enough into it to know what it entails. And if it's something I'd want to risk my life with also, once you have kids, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I feel like risking my life less. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, look, I'm 49 yeah. and at this age, an injury takes a long time to recover <laughs> totally. from. So totally. uh, I don't have kids, but I have a yeah. body that I'm trying not yeah. to abuse trying anymore. To, trying to protect. <laughs> I, feel, I feel you. Yeah. Like my first time bungee jumping was at two in the morning in Cancun. And now that I look back, I'm like, Dude, I, I don't think the safety standards were probably yeah. up to par yeah. in that alley behind the nightclub. <laughs> I, I remember once going to a bar in Tijuana at college. And I remember this yeah. is a bar. This is a nightclub bar with multi, multiple levels. And there it had a fireman's pole that, you know, so it had a holes cut out in the, in the floor of the bar with a pole yeah. that just went down like three floors. And I'm thinking, this is insane. A bunch, a bunch of, of drunk people, drunk people <laughs> yeah. around a three-story fire pole. This, 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 this can't go well often. Yeah, no, that's, Mex uh, Mexico, man. I don't know uh, Mexico. Well, I want to just give a shout out to John Vroman, our yeah. mutual dear friend, for uh, connecting us. Um, and and you popped up on my radar uh, again recently when one of the men in my Elevate Your Relationship program shared an interview that you did recently. Hmm. on another podcast. And this man who's in my program called you a legend. Wow. And, okay. and, and I know a lot of people, Hal, who respect you and your work. And I thought time to invite this legend on the men this way. So uh, I'm really glad to, to, to be sitting with you today, man. Thanks for saying yes. Oh, me too, man. I'm, I'm honored. And you mentioned that what we're talking about today is a little bit outside of the realm, what I normally talk about. And I don't know what we're talking about, but I'm excited because it's always fun to, to, you know, venture outside of the norm. Yeah. And I, and I will, I'll say that I'll, I will have said this in my introduction, you know, about the miracle morning and all of that. But, you know, to, to our listeners, before we got on, I told how, look, uh, we're not talking about the miracle morning today. And I love the miracle morning. The miracle morning, I, I, I did it, but you know, confession, I did it, I don't know, eight years ago, mm. twice. And I was <laughs> high as a fucking kite, man. I was so ecstatic. I remember the first morning I did it, it was in California. I was so ecstatic. And it was like, this is life changing. And it is life changing. Yeah. And I've, I've had a very interesting experience with morning practice over the years. So, but how, how many interviews have you done about the miracle morning? Uh, probably a thousand plus, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, man, I, I, I've never really been one to, to want to do something that's been done a thousand times, yeah. a thousand and one times. There you go. Amen. I don't know. I'm just predisposed to, to try to find new territory. Not that there 
is any new territory we're going to wander into. But I am excited to talk about other things today. Right. So, but I just want you to know, and our listeners, um, maybe we'll sum it up at the end, Miracle Morning. But it'll we'll we'll tell you where you can find out about it and, and all of that because um, it but, is a prof- yeah. it is a profound practice. But this interview ain't about that. Yeah. Here's what I here's what I want to talk about. One word. I want to talk about death with you. Mm. Yes, I love it. Because I know how from from what I've learned of your life story, you have been you have been marked, you have been touched by death intimately mm. in, in in various capacities, from from watching your baby sister die, right? When I think you were eight years old. Yeah. To yes, the car accident that you often talk about. You were hit by, I think, a drunk driver, right? You were yes. 20. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have survived that, you know, shouldn't have you, but you did, but yeah. you shouldn't have. And cancer. I mean, yeah. just just among the few, given a 20% chance of living. So, you know, I know this is a big topic, and and we could do the whole podcast just talking about any one of those uh, events, but but what I want to explore with you and help our listeners to get to know you a bit bit better who may not know you is, um, so if that's the subject, death, take us into from your telling how, how you have been touched by death in these, in these, in these various ways that, you know, where we'll go is like how it informed you, how it, how it's become a part of your being. I'm just, I'm, I'm fascinated by the subject and I, I want to hear from you how, how that's, been a part of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I love, this is a, a topic I don't know that I've ever really gone into. So this is really, it's exciting. It's great. Um, the, so when I was eight years old, you mentioned my, you know, I woke up to my mother screaming across the hall and I ran across the hall and my 18 month uh, old sister, my baby, you know, year and a half old, uh, she was, uh, my mom was giving, performing mouth to mouth, you know, and CPR on her lifeless body. And uh, she died that morning. Mm. And um, the the first thing I'll say about it is uh, when I got the phone call that she died, because what happened was the the fire, you know, her paramedics showed up. My dad came home from work and uh, they they loaded my sister into the back of the ambulance and my mom and dad went with them. And while we were waiting for the ambulance, they had called my my friend's parents and said, hey, can you come pick Hal up? We're going to the hospital and, you know, we think he doesn't need to go, you know, so can you watch him? So I went over to their house, just playing with my friends. And then I get a phone call from my dad and my dad says, and he's crying. First time I probably ever heard my dad cry. And he said, Amory's in my, my sister's name was Amory. He said, Amory's in heaven. And I don't remember exactly what I was thinking um, or even feeling. I just know what I said. Uh, and not to my dad, I, I, you know, I kind of said, so wait, she's, she's dead. You know, I know I asked him, but then I went out into the living room and I would imagine at eight years old that I was having trouble processing that like, wait, so my sister that I see every day, I will never see again. Like, mm-hmm. well, huh? Right. So yeah. probably hard for me to wrap my head around at that age, but I know what I said, which is, I said, Hey, everybody, guess where, guess where Amory is in a really positive, upbeat voice. And uh, I remember my friend Ben's mom, Janine, I I remember her furrowing her brow, like I have a vivid image of her, like kind of tilting her head because I think she knew already and uh, furrowing her brow and really like sadly looking at me. And I said, she's in heaven. Isn't that great? Like heaven's supposed to be the best place ever. She's in Mm -hmm. heaven. And what I, what I having replayed that and analyzed that, I think what I did at that moment was. Um, I don't like these weird feelings that are coming up for me right now. I don't, I don't know what they are. I don't understand them. I've never felt them before. Um, and then I figured out, oh, if you just focus on the silver lining, if you focus on the positive, um, you know, and, and they call that spiritual bypass, I think is one way of, right? Like yeah, I can bypass yeah. that pain and go straight to like, you just kind of just move over it. And what's interesting about that though, is it shaped who I was my entire life and it became my superpower. And like most superpowers, there's a dark side, you know, a shadow side to it. But for the most part, I was able to deal with every challenge I ever faced by immediately accepting the aspect of it that I couldn't change, which, you know, like when my car accident happened, I was hit head on by a drunk driver, 80 miles an hour, found dead at the scene, broke 11 bones, spent six days in a coma, six minutes without a heartbeat, woke up to be told I would never walk again. And I was like, well, if I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life, 
I might as well be the happiest, most grateful person that you've ever seen in a wheelchair because <laughs> I'm in a wheelchair either way. Yeah. And it really is a very, you know, later in my twenties after the car accident started studying like Eastern philosophy, Buddhism, that kind of thing. And it really was, Oh, it's simply being unattached to things you can't change being at peace with life exactly as it is. So it's one of those valuable um, superpowers that I've not only gained, but I've taught this through, you know, t- t- books and speeches I've given over the last few decades. And I've had a lot of people tell me that that has transformed their life because they had been experiencing pain over, you know, like for their, for this one woman, her father had died when she was 17 and I met her when she was 27 and I taught her about accepting life exactly as it is being at peace with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she emailed me a couple weeks later and said, for the first time in my life, I'm not depressed anymore over my dad's Mm -hmm. death. I thought Mm -hmm. it was my dad's death's fault that I was depressed, but I realized I just didn't know that I had another option that I Mm -hmm. could accept it and be at Mm -hmm. peace with it. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Didn't know I had another option. Like are you familiar with Byron Katie? Yeah, totally. I, I love her work. I've studied loving her, what is, yeah, loving what is. Uh, she says something. She has this funny story when you know her mom died, and somebody who didn't know her mom had died, uh, you know, asked her. I hadn't seen her in a while. Say, so, so, how's your mother? Yeah. And Katie says, um, uh, she's dead, so she's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. love that story. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. totally, totally resonate with that. Yeah, and she'll and she'll her her thing is. Um, What's, what does she say? Uh, you can argue with reality, but yeah. you'll only, and you'll lose only lose a hundred percent of the time. That's it. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you had, um, uh, you, then cancer at 37. Now you're f- again, facing your own mortality. Yeah. And, and seriously. So, I mean, the, you're, you're hit by a drunk driver, you wake up, you're alive, yeah. right? It's, it's like, it's, it's probably going to get better from there. It's yeah. uphill from here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I don't know if that's Downhill, right. uphill, Downhill, I know. Whatever. Oh, yeah. it's, <laughs> it only gets better from here. Yeah. Cancer is the opposite. Holy shit. Here yeah. comes the downslide. Oh my God. You were given a 20% chance of living. You're 37. You have, you have two kids, kids at this time. You have yeah, two seven year old daughter and a four year old son at the time. Dude, what, 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 what what's that like? Yeah. So there, it's a few things. Um, one is, uh, I don't exactly remember at what point in my life I became completely at peace with death. It was probably mm-hmm. just through studying enlightenment and, you know, again, Eastern philosophy and going, I'm at peace with everything, mm-hmm. life, death, everything in between. Um, especially the unchangeable. And it's like the ultimate unchangeable is death, right? Like mm-hmm. the day you're born, you, it's guaranteed yeah. that you're going to die. And yet it's people's, you know, number one or number two fear, depending on where public speaking fits in for or you. Public, or public singing. Yeah, public singing. There you go. Um, but uh, that's a good one. I didn't realize. Yeah. I, I was like, because I can public speak, but public singing, <laughs> not so much. Yeah. Um, but but so for me, here's how I look at death. And this for some for some folks, I like I really encourage you to tune in. This might be the most valuable thing I say on the podcast, depending on, you know, where you're at. Um, but the way that I look at death is it's it's nothing it's nothing to be feared first and foremost because it's inevitable like i'm not going to fear something that's inevitable i'm going to make peace with something it's, it's inevitable it's going to happen but here's here's the way that i look at it is that death is the other side of the coin of birth right so if if if, if the coin is life right the, the life is the coin one side of the coin is birth the other side is death and i, I i've never met anyone that fears birth right you don't do you fear birth and it's the people all would even look at you we're like i don't even understand the question why would mm. i fear birth mm. exactly why would you fear death right it, it's the it's 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 once you're born the other side of the coin the inevitable in, right, is death and i don't exactly you know um i have everybody can have their own beliefs on what happens after you die but it, it in in a lot of ways it it, it goes back to the non attachment it, it doesn't matter because whatever happens happens and either you're at peace with it or you live your entire life trying to avoid it <laughs> you know and fearing it and so that for me is I made peace with death. So when I uh, when I got cancer, there's a couple a couple challenges. So a couple things I dealt with. One is I'm like I'm ready to die, like I have no qualms with death. I can I could die today. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other part too that was interesting is because I had written this book, The Miracle Morning, and it had you know it had sold millions of copies, and it was on its own trajectory. Like Miracle Morning is a word of mouth phenomenon. I don't mm-hmm. have to go do interviews to promote it. It's mm-hmm. just people that have read the book and do the practice, tell their yeah. friends, family, right? So so it's just, it, it's like on autopilot. So part of me was like, oh, is it my time to go? 
mm-hmm. because I've already like left my <laughs> legacy. Right. I'm like, Oh, okay. So I was like wrestling with that mm. thought, you know? Mm. Um, but the biggest challenge was I'm okay with dying, but my wife's not okay with me dying. Mm. My yeah. mom and dad are sure as hell not okay with me dying. Um, me dying, uh, from my perspective, it's, you know, would, would be a, a big loss for my kids and would really impact their life potentially in a really negative way, right? I mean, there's a lot of statistics yeah. of not having a father in the home, what that does to a child and where they end up. And um, so honestly, if it wasn't for my wife and kids, there were some periods during, you know, I did, because my cancer was so aggressive and rare, uh, the, the chemo regimen that they hit it with is equally as aggressive. So, you know, a lot of folks that do chemo, it's mm-hmm. maybe like one hour a week, I was 650 hours over seven months. So God, it was a hundred hours a month, 25 hours a week on average. God, um, that's a full-time and, uh, job. Well, it's not full-time, but it's damn. That's, that's, I mean, I, I that's mean, a full-time I lived, job of game. I lived in the hospital and then God. had an apartment. My dad and I rented an apartment next to the hospital where I could go be sick after they kicked me out of the hospital bed because they needed it for another patient. Um, but there were a lot of times during those eight months where if I didn't have a wife and kids that, you know, something to live for, if you will, mm-hmm. um, I'm, I was like, I'm ready to go. You know, and it was almost like as weird as this sounds, it was like frustrating that I had a wife and kids because I'm like, <laughs> I just want to die right wow. now, please. Like, wow. can I just peacefully, wow. you know, just just go? I mean, there were so many nights where I'm in the mm. ER. It's three in the morning. I've got a mm. hundred and four degree temperature. I feel mm. like shit. Right. I've lost every hair on my body. My mm. body weight. I've lost. You know, I went from 167 pounds to 127 pounds. I look like I'm on death's door. I am on death's door. Um so yeah, so I'm very much at peace with death, but mm. not at peace with leaving my mm. loved ones, uh, you know, leaving mm. a void uh, mm. where I think that I can really serve them and even mm. serve humanity. I can, you know, with my work, I can still help other people. And if I'm gone, I, I can't help at the same level uh, just by leaving the book behind, you know? Yeah, man, there's a million rabbit holes I want to dive <laughs> down here with you, but oh, we have to choose, don't we? <laughs> You know, I I, I long ago realized that if I were to live every day as if it were my last, I would never do the laundry. (laughs) (laughs) Right? That's funny, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm curious, beyond living the moment, like what are the essential, you know, death brings gifts, the confrontation with it, whether it's someone close to you dying or you facing your own mortality when we, when we allow it to, I mean, I know we can, we can choose cynicism and we can, you know, stick our head in the sands and pretend it didn't happen and denial, all all that stuff. Or we can open up to its gifts, to the gifts that it has for us and, and the ways that it can inform our life. I mean, I know even, even boyhood to manhood rituals, there's a confrontation with death that men to truly step into our adult manhood, we have to confront death. I mean, boys do this as teenagers, right? In all kinds of risk-taking ways. I mean, I was in a fraternity. Were you in a fraternity by any chance? No, College fraternity, anything like that? I was, or, not. I was in the military. Like there's there's all these pseudo initiations that are confrontations with very risky behavior. Because we like we have to confront death. Yeah. So what, what are some of the gifts beyond just live in the moment? I'm curious, like how has death, like to just take us more into how do you deal with that, you know, that dance between, you know, you got to do laundry. I don't know. Maybe you pay someone to do your laundry, uh, but, no, we do. <laughs> but I, 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 get, I pay my wife indirectly. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. As the breadwinner, I guess. Right? Yeah. Fair enough. But you do things that you wouldn't do if today was your last day, right? Yeah. Yeah. How how does death inform you in 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 the mundane sense, in the daily sense? Yeah, Um, I I will say that uh, the when it comes to the right again the other side of the coin, life, death, birth, death, etc. I do believe in living, you know, as as cliche as this phrase is, but I'll unpack it to make it less cliche. But living life to the fullest. Um, I, you know, I read a book, uh, years ago, probably 13, 14 years ago called the rhythm of life by Matthew Kelly. And in that book, he talks about the purpose of life is to become the best version of yourself. Um, and I really subscribe to that. Uh, and, and, and I go, I go a little bit further in that the purpose of life is to become the best version of yourself, or I usually use the language 
to fulfill your potential, right? So just two, two different ways of saying the same mm-hmm. thing. But, but I add to it in service of others. So to me, I think the greatest gift we can give to those we love, to those we lead, as well as ourselves, which by the way, we are the first person that we love and lead, or hopefully we love ourselves. Um, but the greatest gift we can give to those we love and lead is to fulfill our potential so that we can help them fulfill theirs, right? You, you can't help your kids fulfill their potential by telling them they should, right? Mm-hmm. They, they are going to watch the way you live. And that's mm-hmm. true, not just for whether you have kids or not. It's just your, your friends or right. everyone, yeah. right? How you live your life gives other people permission to do the same, right? When they see what's possible through you. So to me, the ultimate responsibility that we have is we, we have a responsibility to fulfill our potential, to become the best version of ourselves, to live to our you know full potential. The the miracle morning in essence is like, that's kind of what it is. It's well, not kind of, I mean, it's, it's a daily ritual that enables you to level up every single day and become a better version of who you were when you went to bed the night before. Right. So that, you know, I've been doing, doing the miracle morning every day at six to seven days a week for again, right, roughly 14 years, right around when I first read that book. And, um, and so that to me, that, that is it. It's, it's like the, the idea that death is there, it's like, what am I going to do between now and then? Right? Right. De- death's inevitable. What yeah. shall I do between now and then? Um, yeah. And that to me, to me personally, it's live to your full potential, strive every day to level up, to achieve your goals, to become a better version of who you were when you went to bed the night before and, and do it while actively helping those around you to do the same. So that mm-hmm. to me is kind of death's the, the fight, right? If you're running the marathon, it's the, it's the final marker, mm. right? How am I going to show up between now and then? Mm. Have you heard that? Uh, there's a beautiful short poem written by, I believe the poet Virgil. It says, uh, <clears throat> death twitches my ear live. He says, I'm coming. I haven't heard that. No. Yeah. No. Death twitches my ear live. Mm. He says, I'm coming. You know, uh, how I'm playing these days. I, I'm I'm about to hit 50. I've achieved, you know, in my my younger dreams. I'm living them, man. I've got yeah. an amazing woman. I've got the work that I love. I've got the dog I always wanted. Yeah. Uh, I've got a home. I didn't. I never actually knew that I wanted, but I have it, and I'm thrilled uh, about it. I've got great community around me. Like I, I feel deeply, deeply fulfilled and and accomplished. I'm not a I'm not a millionaire, but that was never on my vision board, man. I just I yeah. just you know. So, but I'm playing this with it with this interesting tension. Because I I ran into this interesting challenge that I never anticipated when I finally kind of got everything that I thought I wanted. Now what? Yeah. It's kind of, okay, whoa, how do I now just enjoy this? Right. How do I, I didn't know how to do that. I knew how to, how to to achieve and strive and yeah, sure. Exactly. So I'm curious, like I've been playing with this tension between ambition and contentment Mm. because they're, they, they're seemingly, it's like a paradox in a sense. Yeah, totally. Right. So I'm curious, you know, you had said you said the words earlier, spiritual bypassing. I mean, there's a lot of in the entrepreneurial community, the coaching community, there's a lot of just focus only exclusively on ambition, yeah. leveling up all, all of that. I mean, you're a successful man. You, you've achieved also many things. I mean, you, you've done what what most men would dream to do to, to be successful here, successful in relationship, family, yeah. home, etc. And yet. So maybe let's start here. First off, what do you think people get wrong about success and ambition and achieving? What do you think? What do you, what, what, and, and well, let's, let's start there first. Yeah. I think think that it's the, it's the simple, you know, and obviously I'm not the first person to say this, but it's the misconception that, uh, that what you want is in what you're pursuing. So, right. Or, or put another way that happiness is in, will be found in the goal when you get there. And the reality is if you can't decide to be happy with the life you have now, most likely you will never be happy with the life that you think you Mm -hmm. want, that you Mm -hmm. think will bring you happiness. And the best example of that is uh, celebrities, people Mm -hmm. that are like very, or not just celebrities, but people that are very successful, like monetarily speaking, where they have achieved everything they ever wanted. uh, And then they turn to drugs or alcohol or sex or some other vice, yeah. or they kill themselves. All right, how many yeah. celebrities have, have committed suicide or died of an overdose? Yeah. And it's because they were always chasing the thing that they thought would bring them fulfillment, 
when the reality is, and, and this is, you know, this is my bold statement for everybody that you, if you're listening to this right now, if you're alive, you already have everything that you need to be the happiest that you could ever be. And it is called life. If you wake up every day, you can literally go, thank God I'm alive. This is the best day of my life. Mm. Well, why is it the best day of your life? Was it better than other days? No, it's the, every day is the best mm. day of my life because mm. I'm alive. And, but wait, you're, you're struggling financially right now. I know. I'm thank God every day is the best day of my life. It makes it a lot easier to deal with all these challenges that life brings and presents. Yeah. And so to me, that's the biggest thing is that you really have to decide I'm going like, you have to decide what's the end game. And the end game is you want to feel a certain way. Well, mm -hmm. that's why we do everything that we do. Why do you mm -hmm. turn on Netflix? Man, yeah. I'm bored. I'm going to, I'm going to turn on Netflix. I want to, yeah. I want to change, right. Tony yeah. Robbins calls it. You're, right. cha you're chasing states, right. You're yeah. changing your state. I want to feel different. I want to, why are you going to buy that thing? Well, if I buy that Ferrari, dude, it'll, you know, dude, you know, how amazing. I'm going to feel yeah. driving that Ferrari. Right. Everything is how I'm going to feel. And what we're doing is we're putting all these, these, you can call them roadblocks in one way, but these, it's like, I've got to get this to feel this way and then get that. And then I'll feel that way. And then do this and then do that and do that. And, and what I, what we've been, the problem is we've been conditioned to think that when good things happen or when we get the things we want, then we feel good. But when bad things happen or we don't get the things we want, then we feel bad. And then therefore how we feel is out of our control. And what I would offer everybody, I'd invite you to consider a different paradigm. Instead of when good things happen and I get what I want, I feel good and bad things happen. I don't get, I feel bad. How about no matter what happens and no matter what I do or don't get, I choose how I feel. I feel however I want to feel. And, and I, what I learned, I think one of the biggest lessons from my car accident, you know, I, I said early on that I decided if I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life, I will be the happiest, most grateful person you've ever seen in a wheelchair. When I had cancer, I told my wife the day I was diagnosed, I said, sweetheart, um, two things I told her. Number one, I know the doctor says there's a 20 to 30% survival rate, but I want you to understand that's, that's everyone that gets this cancer, including those that have terrible mindsets those that eat horrible, those that do the minimum needed to, to, to heal. I'm not that person. I said, I will do everything in my power to heal for our family and for myself. And so I said, in my mind, I don't, I'm not going by the statistic they gave me. I'm telling you, there's a 100% chance that I'll be amongst the 20 to 30% of those that survive it. Cause I'll do everything that they do and more. Yeah. So that was the first thing I told her. The second thing I told her is I said, sweetheart, I'm taking a page out of my car accident book. I said, I have decided I'm probably about to endure the most difficult time in my life. And sadly, you know, it, it, it broke my heart that she was going to be mm. on that journey. And, and mm. so were my kids because mm. I can't, you know, I can only do what I can do for me. I said, but um, I've already decided I'm going to be the happiest and the most grateful I've ever been while I endure the most difficult time in my life. And so if you're listening to this, right, or watching this, um, consider that, that, the two are not mutually exclusive. We've been conditioned to think that they are like, I feel based on what's happening. If it's what I want, then I feel good. And, you know, um, but no, how about, man, this sucks. What I'm going through right now is painful. It is difficult. It is unbearable. Thank God I get to choose to be the happiest, the most grateful, the most at peace. Like you, you, you use your own, use your own language. You choose what you want to feel. Mm -hmm while I endure this. And if you, you know, if there's a Miracle Morning movie, there's a documentary on Amazon Prime. Um, and there's a scene in the movie. It's probably the most powerful scene. It wasn't, you know, planned. But um, I kept recording selfie videos. And these were, I didn't know that we weren't making the movie. I didn't know these were going to be the movie. And, uh, but I was doing selfie videos for like my friends, my family, my community. And I was recording videos every day basically doing what I'm doing now, which is like sharing this positive perspective and outlook that I have and how I'm dealing with it and encouraging people to deal with their challenges in the same way. Well, one day um, I was supposed to get chemo in my spine, which is as bad as it sounds, right? Like, you know, when they're telling me, yeah, we're going to inject chemo in your spine. We got to do this like four times. And uh, so one day she goes to inject chemo in my spine and she ends up injecting into one of my nerves. And um, I end up experiencing the most horrific migraines that I've never even, and I told you before I get migraines, mm -hmm. like I've never experienced anything like this, but it was constant for 11 days. It was mm -hmm. around the clock for 11 days. And so one day I'm, I'm just, I'm talking to my dad, he's with me in the hospital and I'm just like crying. I'm in so much pain. And I said, dad, 
you know, I gave him the phone. I'm like, turn on, turn on the camera. Like I'm capturing all these positive moments and mindset. I want, I want to capture, this is the, probably the lowest moment in my life. I've mm. never been so unbearably distraught. Mm. Mm. And so you see it in the film where I'm crying, I'm bawling my eyes out. I can barely talk and I'm jet, but I'm genuine in saying this doesn't change that, that, I am grateful for every moment, including the most mm. painful ones, yeah. because that old adage that if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger um, to me is true. Like the, the greater the adversity, the greater the opportunity to learn from it, to grow, to evolve, to become a better version of yourself, the greater, you know, I heard somebody say recently, the greater the adversity, the greater your destiny. You know, and I, and I really believe that. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that for me, was like, even, even in your worst, you can choose the mindset that you adopt. Now I could have been like, this isn't fair. I don't deserve, I didn't deserve the car accident. This right, drunk right. driver, what a jerk. I hate him. I have hate in my heart for the rest of my life, you know? Um, but now it's like, I, I forgave the drunk driver. Yeah. I'm a P, you know what I mean? And so it's like, just realize that, that you can either allow your circumstances, other people, situations that are out of your control, the government, COVID, like whatever. You can allow your emotional, mental and emotional well-being to be dependent on those things that you can't control. Or you can decide, hey, the last thing I can control is my mental and emotional well-being, no matter what's happening to me. Yeah. When I was 26, I had a car accident. I was in the military. I had a, had a car accident that I should not have walked away from mm. uh, either. I was, it was a, a near head on collision on a highway. The car I was in crossed the median into mm. oncoming traffic. And we were almost hit by two uh, semi trucks coming at us, you know, 60 miles an hour. Anyway, yeah. I remember I was 26 and, and, and I was euphoric in the days that followed euphoric. You know, I, I felt like, you know, those old video games, the old racing video games where you had to race and you had 26 seconds to get to the next, the, yeah. the, the next flag. And if you got through the next barrier, then you'd get another 26 yeah, seconds. Yeah, or yeah. 30. <laughs> I felt yeah. like I had just barely made the, the finish line. And now, okay, now I have bonus time, right? This uh, is bonus time. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes I reflect back every moment, everything, even this moment right here is bonus time because I shouldn't yeah. have walked away from that moment. And, and and there have been some hard fucking times in the time since. And, and I think, you know, this, this, here's a question that I have for you because that's great. I love the, I love the, 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 the positive reframe of everything. I, I'm all about it, Hal. I'm all for it, man. Yeah. And I'm curious, has that, has that predisposition ever pissed off your wife? All the time, of course. All <laughs> Tell the me more. Time. Take us into it, please. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, she, so like, <laughs> so one of the things I I teach when I when I teach uh, about how to accept life as it is, I teach two strategies. Number one is the five minute rule, and number mm. two is what I call the can't change it mantra. So the five minute rule I learned in my when I was twenty. Right, thankfully before the accident, because that's what I used uh. when I woke up from the coma and the five minute rule. I learned it in my sales training, and it was simply that uh, when something goes wrong. You know, you get bad news, you, you, you fail to reach a goal, you know, you go bankrupt, you know, someone dies. I mean, literally whatever it is, um, we were taught to set our, now, now to be fair, it was, the context was sales. So it was like customer cancels an order. You don't reach your goal for the week. Right. You drive out to an appointment and no, somebody no shows you. And rather than let it ruin your day <laughs> or your week, yeah. you set the timer on your phone for five minutes and you give yourself yeah. five minutes to bitch, moan, complain, cry, vent, punch a wall. Great and practice. then- you say, and then I move on to this three, three word mantra, which is a timer goes off, take a deep breath. And I say three words, can't change it. It's a simple acknowledgement. I can't change what happened five minutes ago. So right now I have, I have a choice. I can either be miserable and blame it on what happened five minutes ago, or I can be, I can accept what happened five minutes ago because I can't change it. And the only logical choice I really have is to accept it and be at peace with it. And then focus 100% of my energy on what I can change. And so, um, I, so I learned that and that, and that's what I teach in my speeches and this and that. Mm -hmm. and, um, but so, yeah, so like my wife, you know, I taught that to my wife when we were first dating, she was 19, we started dating and, mm. you know, she's like, oh, that's really cool. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then once we got past the, you know, the, the infatuation honeymoon yeah. phase and, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and everything's not cool just cause we're dating, uh, it, you know, and yeah. she'd be like, oh my gosh, this happened at work uh, and this person, this and da, 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 da. And I can't uh, believe we were so rude. And I'm like, <laughs> 
Yeah. I'm like, you can't change it though. Right. Nope. She's like, I don't want to hear your motivational oh bullshit. Gosh. Yeah. 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 Like, I love it. Yeah. So, so yeah, <laughs> so that's for sure. For sure. It, yeah. To this end to this day, but now she actually, it's okay. It really makes my, it makes my soul sing when I occasionally will hear her say it now or like to our kids or whatever. Well, hey, you know, it's something you can't, she says it much better than me. She, she usually takes longer to get there. I'm just like, go right in, can't change it. Right. Then, right, uh, right. Yeah. She's, much, she's a woman. She's much better at uh, like, well, let me, how does that make you feel? And okay. And then she leads our kids to, you know, well, is that something you can change or should we just move toward acceptance? You know, so yeah. yeah. She's better than me. Well, you know, I, this is a big question because I, it also ties into attention. I think a lot of men particularly experience the tension between mission and relationship. Sure. That, that's yeah. how I frame it. Mission and relationship. You, you've seen any of the mission impossible movies. Oh, love them. Yeah. Well, Tom Cruise, or is it Ethan Hawke? Is it? No. What's yeah, his name? Yeah, Ethan Hawke. That's it one is of them. Ethan yeah. Hawk. Okay. I think so. He's married at some point. He gets married, right? But he can't be with his wife because if he, if he goes and bees with his wife, the, the world will literally be destroyed. Mm. Like literally. Two, like, yeah. I don't know, a third of the population of planet Earth will die if he does marriage. Mm. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of a yeah. it's kind of a fucked up premise yeah. and yet so naturally he does the noble thing which is he chooses mission i'm gonna save the planet fuck marriage save yeah. the planet right i think so many men we 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 struggle with this tension i mean you're you are an ambitious man you have a vision to live your fulfilled self to you've got i mean look at all the uh, looking at your wall how many is that, is that are those all book covers what is that behind yeah. you yes book covers Book covers, I'm, sh I'm sure you got more in the pipeline, at least in your visioning and thinking and dreaming. Yeah. yeah. How do you navigate the tension between your ambitions, even that, yeah. even in that moment, the ambition of getting out of this fucking discomfort, you know, or the negative thinking or the, cause even that's an ambition. Yeah. That can, yeah. that, that can, you know, throw empathy overboard. It can... You know, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a spiritual fuck you to your feelings. It can be anyway, you know? Yeah. Right. I mean, which is, totally. which are, which are, it's not relational is what I mean. Like our, our yeah. ambition often takes us out of relationship. Totally. It's a conflict. Yeah. And yet I know that you're all in on your relationship. How do you navigate that tension? Like, how has that been a struggle for you in the past? If it has, I mean, take us into that. Yeah. So one of the biggest wake up calls for me when I got cancer was, oh, I'm a workaholic and I put family last, even though I tell people and I actually believed it that family is first. And what I do often, if I'm depending, I've given a message called what matters most a few times since the cancer journey. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I always ask the audience and it's usually like entrepreneurs. I say, hey, um, uh, how many of you would say, how many of you are, you know, married and go up? How many of kids? Okay. How many of you uh, would say you're either your spouse, you know, your family, if you have kids come first and all those same hands go back up and I go, okay, thank you. Um, now put your hand back up if, and only if, uh, I were to look at your schedule and that it would be obvious <laughs> what you just, what you just claimed. Nice play. And very well few hands go back up. Yeah. And I go, just cause you think family is first. Hmm. You, you can't just think it. And it's like, it's like wishful thinking, right? Hmm. Like, and, uh, and, and so for me, um, there was, a, a, an alignment to, to get back to that to your, to, or not, or not even back to it, to get to that place where I was actually putting family first. There's a few things. And I went and I'm, I love this question because it, it really is uh, not an easy one to answer. There's a lot of nuances. Mm. Um, but so uh, what I did is I was like, okay, I need to be like a stay at home dad. Um, that was like my, I'm like, I, you know, after the cancer, I'm like, I need to just not work anymore. I just need to like cut my expenses, just live off my book sales. And like, that's what I thought I needed to do. And my wife was not on the same page. Um, and then I created a story. I'm like, cause she doesn't want to be around me that much, I guess. Like, mm. I'm not sure, but, but, but here's what I found is that, um, that the, that working like your, your, your children, right. Just other people. It goes back to what we said, like leading by example, right. How you live your life gives other people permission to do the same. So I realized that, um, a healthy set level of ambition, and I'll talk more about how to balance it, but, um, is like my kids seeing me fulfill my dreams, seeing me 
live in alignment with my values, one of which is contribution, where I'm going out of my way to help other people, um, right? That is arguably more valuable and more impactful for them than me sitting on the couch next to him playing a board game. Uh, well, both are important, right? But, um, but, but in terms of in general, them seeing that, oh, dad is, you know, is he is mission driven. He does work that he loves, right? I'm able to share that lesson with them. If you, if you find work that you love, you know, you know, you don't work a day in your life. I don't feel like I'm working. I don't hate my work. I don't like most people where I don't want to go to my job. Like I love what I do. So that was the first place I had to get to was like, okay, I needed to resolve, wait, being a good spouse and a good father doesn't mean being home all the time and being stay at home, right? Uh, work is important. Leading by example is important, not to mention putting food on the table. However, um, how will I make sure that I'm spending quality time with my family? And that really is it. It's really an hour a day uh, with my family minimum to ensure, and I'm really connecting. And there's a few things that I do. One really simple hack is, you know, one of the essence or the elements of Miracle Morning is reading. And so I gravitate because I'm always on mission. I want to change the world. I gravitate toward reading business books or books on related to my work and my purpose and book, you know, books on books or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I have a rule, a self-imposed rule that I'm not allowed to read a book on uh, business on anything until I've read a book on either marriage or parenting or some other family topic. Mm. So what that does is a, it ensures that I'm learning and growing every morning in my most important role as a husband and a father. Um, it also by, by making it so that I have to read that book first, it actually is reminding myself actively every mm. single day. Yes, this is my top priority. Yeah, I really want to get back into that book that I read yesterday, but my highest priority is my family. So just read, just following that rule is an affirmation to myself that I'm a family man first. I also changed my bio. Actually, Front Row Dads inspired me. I remember Front Row Dads with John Roman. If you're a dad, you've got to go to frontrowdads.com. It's phenomenal. I was, I was just thinking about John as you're as you're talking right now and the, and the slogan that the, it, it, keep going. This is yeah. right on point. Yeah, yeah. Family men with businesses, not businessmen with families. I John love Rowe that. Is the, yeah, front row dads slogan. So, um, but so for me, with with uh, with front row dads, um, I oh, where was I going with that? Family first, first thing in the morning. Um, oh, I I updated my bio. Um, we at one of the front row dads retreats, they gave us these wrist these or like really nice leather bracelets that said family man, comma et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it was some famous guy, I don't remember his name, but he was like a billionaire, you know, helped all these charities, did all this amazing work. Mm -hmm. And, and when he died, his bio or whatever you call it, when you're, you know, I forgot what it's called, but when, when someone dies, um, mm -hmm. it said family man, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It didn't say billionaire philanthropist mm -hmm. who started all these companies. He's mm -hmm. like, all that shit fits in ETC dot. Mm -hmm. I love that. Wow. <laughs> what actually matters is family. And so, you know, John Vroman, when he started Front Row Dads, it was all about um, my kids aren't going to remember how many mortgage payments I made or how many books I sold or how many speeches I gave or how cool I was or what they're going to remember how much I engaged with them in a meaningful way. Yeah. And that was a game changer for me to realize that. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say on this is where we place our value. And I valued quantity over quality. Meaning I'm on this mission to change millions of lives. Literally, my mission in life was to change, you know, at first it was change 1 million lives one morning at a time. And then when the Miracle Morning sold a million copies, it became my mission is to elevate the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time. Hmm. Um, and so that always trumped family. It was like, well, I've, I'm on this, I've got, I'm hmm. on this mission. People need me. And here's what I realized, or here's what I decided, I should say decided because you could argue yeah. either way. Yeah, yeah. I decided I can, the quality of impact that I can make with my kids and my wife being here in their proximity in, right, you know, and actually engaging with them trumps the impact that I can make from giving a one hour speech yeah. or giving a one hour interview. Even if I give a thousand one hour interviews, that's not going to impact any one person as much as, as my, my role as a family man. And so I really decided yeah. after cancer that the, my number one priority is to be the best husband and father mm -hmm. and author, speaker, all those other, that, that's, that is all secondary. 
I love that family man, comma, et cetera. That's yeah. really profound. Uh, particularly I, I grew up uh, with my dad and stepmom wanting to save the world in some big way. Meanwhile, their family was in shambles. <clears throat> and it's mm, never yeah. and, and, and it's never recovered. They've mm. they've they've lived in the we we have this giant mission to change the consciousness of the planet in, in their yeah. way. But meanwhile, the the family consciousness it was devastated and mm. they it's never been repaired. So um I think that's a such a such an important um thing for, for for us to explore. Now in, in the in the in the few minutes that we have left, I, I'm curious as we're, we're in the domain of relationship, I know you've had a transformational shift. Like mm. a lot of men, especially that come into my world, they're stuck. They're mm. stuck in relational, in the relational grind. You had a transformation in the relational grind. The question I want to ask is what have you learned? What do you think men, re, men specifically really mm. need to know or learn to create a truly fulfilling, intimate relationship? Yeah, well, uh, it is no coincidence that your article uh, that you wrote many years ago called "Choose Her Every Day," that is that was the game that was a game changer for me. Uh, my wife and I had just moved to Texas from California. I bought a house sight unseen for her, and then when she finally saw it, she's like, "I don't like it at all." It's mm. like, <laughs> oh, man. no, no, seriously, you love it, right? No, no, I don't <laughs> like it at all. And now we live here. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, that was back in my miracle morning was taken off. I was working again, workaholic, you know, I got to work weekends, got to work all the time. Just one more weekend, sweetie, this book will be done. This thing will be done. And so we were in major conflict in our relationship, perpetual mm -hmm. conflict. And, uh, I, uh, we got in such a huge fight right before a camping trip that I decided I'm not going. Mm -hmm. And so she went without me with the kids. And in my mind, I'm so positive, I, you know, a spiritual bypass, whatever. I'm like, great. I get time to work. This is yeah. awesome. You know? <laughs> yeah. Now looking back, I would never miss that trip again. You know right, what I mean? But right. it is what yeah. it is. And so yeah. while she was gone, I discovered your article, choose mm -hmm. for every day. And I realized I've never given my wife the luxury, the, the mm -hmm. safety, the security of feeling like I'm, I choose for every day. When we were mm. dating, I was dating other people and I was sneaking around. And, mm. you know, so, so right off the get go, mm. right. I plant seeds of doubt and that she's not good enough for me mm. in there. Mm. And then I think, honestly, I was, you know, I was always like, I'm a perfectionist. If it's like, Oh, you know what? I don't like the way she is in this way. Maybe we should, you know, maybe, maybe there is somebody better. Maybe we're not going to make it. I don't know. Right. And I just realized I'm not choosing her every day. And so I, um, I, I decided I wrote an affirmation and here's what I realized. This was, this was the game changer. And for men listening, this to me is the ultimate game changer. Um, most of us live in what I call reciprocal relationships, mm. which is where our energy, our tone, our mood matches the other person, right? Oh, you, my wife's being so sweet to me today. And then you're sweet to her. Just, mm. it's just it's human nature. It's natural. It's often unconscious. My wife's a bitch today. Fuck, you know, like I'm not, mm. you know, I'm not going to take that. You don't just don't mm. treat me like that. You know, we mm. reciprocate the energy. And I realized that is a losing strategy for a relationship mm. because there's always going to be one, one partner's going to be having a good day and one's having a bad day and what, right. And yeah. so what I decided is, wait a minute, like, and, and, you know, and I could pull out a little masculinity and go like, that's not being a man. You're at the whim of your wife's moods. You, mm. what a, what a put, you know, I call you lots of names, right? Mm. Um, and I realized that's, that's not being a man. A man is someone that says, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. These are my values. This is the husband I'm committed to being or the boyfriend or whatever, no matter what. And nothing that another person, namely my wife says or does changes how I'm going to show up to me. That's, that's being in your masculine, like true masculine. Yeah. I am committed to being compassionate, empathetic, loving, affectionate, yeah. romantic. That's the man I'm committed to being. And so what I did is I put it in writing I, in the form of an affirmation. Mm -hmm. I wrote, this is the husband I'm committed to being. And I wrote down every attribute of what I felt like was the perfect husband, the husband that my wife or any wife deserved. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote down some very important uh, contingency plans which is like, okay, all right. So it's going to be easy to be this way right now when I'm sitting in my living room and she's out of town on a camping trip and right. But what about when she yells at me? What about when she says something that just infuriates or triggers me? Okay. And so I wrote down, if my wife acts in a way that, that bothers me, that triggers me, I, ha I will work even harder 
to embody what I just wrote above. Mm. So rather than going, rather than mirroring her energy, it's like, oh, wow, she's having a bad day. And that's the thing is most often nothing's ever personal. If if your yeah. wife's angry, even if it's something you did, it's still about her emotions, her feelings, her childhood, her trauma, her this, or you've done this a bunch of times and she has every right to get pissed off at you, right? You're looking at this one incident, you're isolating the incident, but it's really like, dude, she's got seven years of you doing this, right? Yeah. Like, you're lucky <laughs> right. she didn't throw something at your face. Right. Like, and, you know? and, all, and all the other men before her from her uncles, yeah. her fathers, yeah. her brothers, her peers, that, that also, so yeah. Totally. And so that was it. And so I wrote this affirmation. I went one step further, which is I created what I called my forever pledge. And it was, I wrote this document for her where it said, basically it was, I'm committed to you forever. There's nothing you could do to ever change that. Um, and I basically addressed all of her fears that she had, all of her fears from a divorced parent, but her also just her fears from me, you yeah. know, not being faithful in the very beginning. Um, I addressed all of it. And then I signed my name. I dated it. And then I didn't just print it out on a piece of paper. I went on shutterfly.com and I ordered it on an 11 inch by 14 inch, beautiful frame document with a heart border, like really nice. And I nailed it in. I hung it next to her bed mm -hmm. so that she would see it every morning when she woke up and every night before bed. Um, and then I, so that was, so she would have a symbol of my commitment to her to help her get over the trauma that she had and that I had created. And then also I read that affirmation every single day and I embodied it. And within a matter of, you know, weeks and then months, it transformed our relationship. And that's the message I have for guys is that you have more power than you realize Fact. and you can't change her. You can only change you and you have a responsibility to define the partner that you're committed to being, put that in writing, affirm it every day, and then embody it every single day and watch how it transforms your relationship, how you show up and how she eventually responds. Whew. We just dropped the mic there. Hal, you are, you are, you are a man committed to excellence in every domain. And I see that in, in your family life, your professional life, your intimate relational life, man, uh, tr truly an inspiration and, and, um, and uh, a legend in the making. Let's say Thank that. You, now we're just, we got a couple minutes left. We're just going to finish with a little lightning round. Yeah. Um, I, I call this the, the five core emotions. Okay. Right. Very simple. What makes you mad? No, what makes you mad is when uh, people treat other people poorly. I'm with you on that. What makes you feel sad? What makes me feel sad is when I see people that are suffering that don't deserve to be suffering, meaning, you know, human trafficking or starvation, that kind of thing. Mm. What causes you to feel joy? What makes me feel joy is when my kids express love toward me. Mm. How old are your kids now? Uh, t uh, oh, now 13 going on 17 <laughs> and 10. <So> my, <laughs> oh, wow. my daughter is 13 uh, going on 17 okay. and my son is 10. Okay, beautiful. Uh, what causes you to feel fear? Mm, the state of the world uh, and what I see happening with um, a lot of tyrannical you know, governments uh, pushing agendas that I think are not in our best interest, but in theirs, and that could potentially cause us pain in the future. Okay. And last one is dealer's choice. What causes you to feel either shame or embarrassment or just makes you want to hide from the world? Mm. Uh, I think that it's when, when I do or say something that's out of alignment or the perception of it is out of alignment with my values. So if someone thinks, oh, you're just trying to sell me something and I'm mm. like, no, 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 but I'm not right. Mm. Or, you know, or are you, a, are you like, are you a lot like anything? Are you a liar? If someone, if I send out an email mm. and it's misinterpreted and then mm. I, or I say something in a podcast, <laughs> right. And then I go back and I'm like, oh, I could see how they would think yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, God, I, you know, I need to talk to him and let him know that's not what I meant. I'm so sorry. Uh, right. Yeah. So I think that's it. I, I really, I, 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 I'm a yeah. values driven person. And yeah. whenever someone interprets me outside of my values, it, it really causes that. I, I get that, man. I, I essentially never promote other people's work. Not, not, I, not cause I'm stingy, but I'm afraid I have feel fear that I'm going to mm. promote something. I don't have that much knowledge about, uh, and it's gonna, it's gonna be bullshit and yeah. I'm going to be called out on it. And so I, I'm incredibly stingy with, with, with that. Um, 
Hal, thank you for being here. Where can people learn more about you? What, what do you want them to know that you're up to? Uh, where can they find out about the Miracle Morning? Yeah, yeah. Go to MiracleMorning.com. That is the hub for all things. You can watch the free documentary there. You can download the free app. You can link to all the different Miracle Morning books and you can join the Miracle Morning community, which is um, made up of hundreds of thousands, well, millions of people from over 100 countries that are waking up to their full potential and really supporting each other and doing the same. And it has become a movement. And um, I'd love for you to be part of it. Hal, thank you again for saying yes to being on Men This Way, brother. Uh, it's, it's an honor, brother. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate you, man.